Welcome to Krav Life. I'm Paul Simos, and today on Train to Fight, we've got a extra special guest, Mr. Nir Maman, and um, it's going to be an awesome interview with him today. Now, before the interview ends, all right, I just want you to know that you are not alone. We actually have a whole community of Kravists that are waiting to network with you. Uh, we share tips and tricks and uh, stuff to make your experience of Krav Maga better and for you to learn faster. So you just go to mycrovlife.com, hit the community button and join other Kravists, join our community for free. All right, so without further uh, ado, here is Mr. Nir Maman. So, welcome to the show, sir. How are you doing? I'm doing wonderful. It's great to be here with you finally. I apologize for how long it's taken, uh, but thank you for having me. How are you doing? I'm doing great. Um, yeah, so so there's been a lot of people have been asking for, for this interview and, and asking uh, to have you on the show. Um, thank you. So for, but for the people, uh, for our audience that doesn't know who you are, um, can you quickly introduce yourself? Uh, sure. My name is uh, Nir Maman. Um, you want me to go into all my my background? <laughs> so we'll sure. Well, yeah. <laughs> well, yeah. Let's let let's. <laughs> okay. So so let's start with um, how did you how did you get started in um, in I guess mar martial arts in general? What like was Krav Maga the first um, the first thing you ever did, or you know did you have prior martial arts experience? What what are the origins? Sure. Um, so, uh, I, uh, I started very young. I started at, uh, going on about five years old. Um, I was very fortunate in that, uh, I came from a family, uh, on my father's side, mostly, uh, who were martial artists. Um, so he grew up in a very large family. He had about, uh, eight siblings, um, grew up in, uh, Morocco, uh, North Africa, and um, they were all in the martial arts. The majority of uh, him and all the siblings were in the martial arts from a very, very young age, predominantly uh, karate and uh, and judo. And uh, so it's kind of been in, I guess, in our in our DNA um, in, in the family. It's something that uh, you know the, the day that I became exposed to it, I, I felt attracted to uh, to the martial arts, and it just became part of me instantly. Um, I you know first time I set foot into an actual studio. Uh, I was, uh, again, about five years old. We left Israel. We moved to France. Um, so my, my, my father's family, half are all in Israel, and uh, the rest are all in France. We have a very large family there. And um, there was a studio where some of my uncles uh, were, were training at. So I remember one day they, uh, they took me there. They went to, um, uh, we were walking around town, and we walked into the studio where a friend of theirs was the, uh, the head instructor. It was a... Uh, a mixed uh, mix of different systems there, uh, Japanese systems, judo, ninjutsu, karate. Um, I walked in, I was enamored instantly by everything. A lot of ninja paraphernalia and punching bags. That was the very first time I, I walked up to a punching bag and punched it and kicked it. And uh, we were living there for about a year. And uh, that's where, you know, uh, my, my informal training kind of, kind of began. Um, there was a lot of... Um, Again, informal, I'll use the word sessions that uh, that we would get at home uh, from my dad. Uh, he's had his martial arts background. He also served in the IDF. He was a Club Maga instructor for a period of time in the IDF. Um, I had no clue what Club Maga was, obviously, as a kid. Mm -hmm. But, um, you know, there was the influence of, of all of these kind of uh, styles and systems and experiences from my, uh, my father's uh, history that, um, that kind of influenced our, our training. We moved to Canada about a year later, uh, so I was around six years old, and um, I don't remember just how soon, but very soon after, you know, landing boots on the ground in, in Canada, uh, I started the conventional route of, uh, I think it was judo that I started with at the local community mm -hmm. center uh, in our neighborhood. Um, from there, I went on to karate. Um, I remember in uh, public school, we had an after-school program uh, in karate, so uh, I signed up for that right away. 
and it just was uh, was nonstop from there. You know, just uh, that was my my thing that I did. I did absolutely nothing. Play in nature, watch mm-hmm. cartoons, and uh, and do martial arts as a as a kid. Um, when I was twelve years old, uh, just before my bar mitzvah, uh, my parents sent uh, my brother and me to Israel uh, to go stay with family for uh, uh, for the entire summer. We were there for about uh, two months, and uh, that's when I learned about Kav Maga. That's when I discovered Kav Maga. Um, my uh, relatives that we stayed with were in a small town called Azul in uh, central Israel. They had a big community center there and there was uh, Kav Maga classes going on. And I happened to stumble on these classes uh, just playing in the basketball court with the uh, neighborhood friends. Uh, and uh, one day going in, I think it was we went to go drink from the water fountain and uh, I looked in the gym and I saw all this martial arts going on. So I right away latched onto that, um, uh, signed up and started, uh, started training, you know, uh, it was Kav Maga. I didn't have a clue what Kav Maga was in the sense of, you know, how it differs greatly with all the other uh, martial arts. I was a kid and to me it was all kicking and punching and, and, and that's it. Um, and a lot of the training is, is what it was. Um, you know, as a, as a kid, really the focus of what you're learning and what you're being taught um is kicking and punching and uh and the rudimentary uh skills mm-hmm. um we got a little bit more into you know defense from from holds escaping from grabs and uh and uh, and all that kind of stuff uh i came back to uh, canada in the uh, summer uh, uh summer break um and uh then i went into uh my track of uh, taekwondo uh is is what i started so kim's black belt academy was the uh the uh, school that I trained at, uh, it was a bus ride uh, a couple blocks away from uh, from my place. Uh, walked in there with a friend of mine one day after school. His mom took uh, my, my friend to go and visit different martial arts schools to sign him up. And uh, I happened to be with him, so I jumped in the car. We went there, walked in. I was hooked right away. Uh, that club was uh, Taekwondo, Hapkido, and uh, Judo. Hmm. To this date, you know, I don't know, 30-plus years later still – some of the most memorable uh, training experiences that I've had came out of that club. Very old school, hardcore, you know, no air conditioning going on. You're drinking out of a dirty, rusty uh, water faucet in the, uh, in the bathroom. And uh, uh, it was it was amazing training. And uh, that's why I uh, latched on to Taekwondo. Uh, Taekwondo is still till today one of my, uh, one of my passions. Um, and uh, that's where that track uh, happened. And... Uh, about uh, two years later, um, no, sorry, not even two years later. Uh, around around that, that's the time I started. I had a I had an incident at uh, at school, um, a uh, very serious incident. My very first major uh, beating that I received in life in a in a street scenario. Mm-hmm. Uh, um, uh, I was in grade six or grade seven, and uh, my best friend at that time and and me, uh, also Jewish. Uh, we got uh, swarmed and beat up by about uh, 25 uh, neo-Nazi skinheads. Uh, two of them were students out of school, and uh, they were already on their way out, uh, being expelled in grade eight. And uh, they always had it in for us. And one day they caught us at the bus stop, uh, just um, uh, off the uh, school property. I took a beating of a lifetime uh, lesson I will never ever forget. That one of the scar- scariest moment of my life to to that point, and that was really where. I think I uh, I had a very uh, uh, grand epiphany and a rude awakening, and uh, uh, really planted my seed in my direction of uh, of how I want to train and what I want to be good at, which is to protect myself. Mm-hmm. And that's where you know I started to become a lot more aware of what I'm training in and researching and searching, you know, different instructors and schools. Um, and uh, it's where I also planted the seed myself, you know that uh, I uh, was going to go into uh, policing, into the military, and uh, become, you know, something for the purpose of uh, standing up against evil. And uh, that's mm-hmm. where that journey uh, started. And so, you know, uh, since then, uh, going back as far as my background, I'm, uh, and I can't believe that I'm actually saying this, but I'm going, going on, you know, I'm, I'm about 40 years, I'm 45 years old, I'm about 40 years of, uh, of being a martial artist, and it's, uh, it's, uh, it's crazy for me to think about that. Um, but uh, Kav Maga is one of my biggest influences. When I joined the IDF, obviously, uh, that's where um, I became exposed 
as to what real Karma Guy is. And, um, you know, Karma Guys, we all know when we say Karma Guy, what the system is. And, uh, and that became a huge part of my DNA. Uh, Jeet Kune Do, the Filipino martial arts, um, you know, on parallel track, they've been one of my biggest influences. Taekwondo, Hapkido. So I have a, I have a second degree black belt in Taekwondo. I'm, um, I'm starting out and training for my third degree black belt uh, uh, test, hopefully soon. First degree black belt in Hapkido. Um, in the civilian world, I have a third degree black belt in, uh, in Club Maga. Uh, I'm an instructor in uh, JKD in uh, Filipino martial arts. And through all those, I have a few systems that I've kind of dabbled in. Uh, mm -hmm. And they've been very influential to me, and I've absorbed a lot, um, you know, mostly by virtue of the instructors that I trained in. Kempo Karate is one of them, American Kempo Karate. Uh, Dave Lane mm -hmm. was, uh, was my instructor here in Toronto, one of the phenoms of uh, an encyclopedia of, of knowledge when it comes to, uh, to street self-defense. And he was teaching uh, once a week self-defense uh, classes at uh, the Taekwondo school that I was training at. And so I uh, was every Friday evening, I uh, jumped into that class uh, uh, regularly for the years that I was there. Um, it was all Kempo based and, uh, you know, I did a keto for a while as well. Um, I dabbled in a few, a few things here and there. I always like to explore and experiment. Mm -hmm. And so in between my main systems, which is really Club Maga, uh, JKD in the Filipino arts, Taekwondo, Hapkido, I have kind of in between the, these, um, you know, roots to, to some other conduits of knowledge and, and, uh, and, and systems that I've mm -hmm. also poured um, into my uh, philosophies and teaching. Uh, but that, uh, in, a, in a nutshell, that's background when it comes to martial arts. Nice. And, um, and so through all that experience, right, you're obviously keeping yourself busy with all those uh, different styles, right? Um, how did, um, what is your, yours is like CT707, right? How did, how did that come about? So CT707 is the name of my uh, training company, my training organization. Um, so in the, uh, in the IDF, I served in the counter-terror unit. Uh, in Hebrew, it's called the Lotal, the Fidel uh, Lohamama Tevo, the counter-terror unit. The counter-terror unit is also the counter-terror school for the IDF. Uh, it is the uh, spearhead unit for everything that governs and is in charge of counter-terror warfare for the entire Israeli Defense Force, both the special forces and anything that uh, includes or is relevant to the regular forces um, as far as counter warfare goes. Mm -hmm. uh, so in Israel, uh, all of our units, they uh, officially, they're designated by an identification number. Um, uh, so that's what they are called as far as the official capacity is their number. My unit number is 707. Um, all the names that they're given is kind of the nickname that relates to their specialties uh, or nicknames that are for different, uh, you know, um, different historical reasons as to uh, how they come up with the names of the units. But my um, unit was 707. Um, so, you know, counter warfare is my, uh, is my, my, my passion. Um, there's the, uh, the uh, kind of the, the art craft of counter warfare. And within that, you have a lot of categories ranging from tactics, from operations, from hostage rescue to arrest to clandestine operations, uh, you know, stealth operations shooting, uh, empty hand uh, combat, um, just to name a few. There's a lot that goes into the other uh, world of counter terror warfare. And um, um, my unit uh, deals with, uh, with both our operational capacity as well as instructional capacity and uh, governing all the TTPs uh, for the IDF. So when I uh, uh, got out of uh, service uh, from the IDF in about uh, 20 2010, uh, I moved back home to, uh, to uh, North America, started my, my organization. Um, it start, started out first really with the uh, kind of thrust was on the Kamaga side of it. Um, I had a lot to do with Kamaga uh, during my service at the counter terror school. And uh, um, there was, you know, as everybody listening here knows that uh, Kamaga uh, has got quite a presence around the world in many camps, at the hands of many people. Uh, uh, there's a lot of legitimate crowd, there's a lot of illegitimate crowd, so there's a lot in between. And mm -hmm. uh, um, uh, I developed my, my system, I'll talk about that momentarily, during my service, and, and I wanted to kind of bring that out into the, uh, into the world. And uh, that's where I, uh, I created CT707 and uh, my brand of, uh, of uh, crop and all the other training that uh, that we do. Um, 
So, uh, you know, as far as my, you know, I don't like to call it my system, but it's kind of my rendition or my interpretation or my, you know, my, again, just for lack of a better term, my, my system of what I teach these days. <coughs> um, my, my official uh, job in, uh, in the unit was a counter warfare instructor. Um, that is, uh, under that umbrella, we have different uh, different tasks that we do, ranging from teaching to, to operation. Uh, in the instructional capacity, I was the lead in charge, I was the lead instructor in charge of the hostage rescue section for the counter school. I was in charge of uh, training our uh, three main hostage rescue units in, uh, in, uh, in the IDF. Um, uh, parallel to that, I was also in charge of our international joint forces training mission section. So since 9-11, Israel has had a, uh, a very predominant relationship and a relationship with a lot of countries around the world that were involved in the uh, global war on terror, and uh, especially the United States of America and uh, the U.S. Uh, Special Operations Command. And, uh, we had on a regular basis um, all, all these units that would be sent to us for training to learn what we've been doing for, you know, 70 years to coexist with and defeat these uh, these threats that the whole world was now introduced to and was now fighting in Iraq and Afghanistan. So before these units were deployed to Iraq and Afghanistan, they'd be sent over to uh, to our school, and uh, we would put them through a variety of uh, training to prepare them for for, uh, for their missions overseas. And they would literally, uh, for the most part, come flying in from whatever bases they were stationed at around the world with their gear. They would go through training um, anywhere from two weeks up to even longer than that, and from they back on their C-130s and off to uh, to Iraq or Afghanistan. Wow. So um, uh, with uh, that section, <coughs> our duties were to develop training uh, programs and then to, uh, to lead all those uh, training programs. And uh, again, it was all centered around counter warfare, uh, shooting, and uh, Kamaga. Um, so I was the elite Kamaga instructor for that, uh, for that division and uh, I would be training all these units as well in, in my system. And um, it really is where um, my experience allowed me to really kind of uh, hone in on one of the most important principles of Kamaga, which it has to be very simplistic, congruent with reality. It has to be learned in a short period of time, retained, and then deployed in a real situation under stress as optimally as possible. And that really mm -hmm. was the uh, structure that I was um, dealing with. Units would come in for, for a few weeks, uh, um, and within those few weeks, I would have to equip them with the best possible methodology, mindset, tactics, and understanding of the various scenarios that that, uh, that were um, uh, you know they were potentially going to be uh, addressing um, in a way that they would learn it, retain it, and be able to effectively apply it. And that is um, really where I developed uh, my. Uh, uh, my system based on that uh, principle, and that's what mm -hmm. I, I teach uh, out there in the world today. Um, so that that, uh, that really is uh, kind of the, uh, the the birth of, uh, of my organization and my uh, my philosophy and, uh, and methodology. So um, can you just so your your philosophy? How do you how do you achieve that in training? Like the simplicity and the uh, and get people to assimilate their knowledge quickly. So, um, you know, the one thing that uh, that you will probably get is that if you're after the true values of simplicity, you probably won't have enough material to run a martial arts business. That's the uh, <laughs> one thing that, uh, yeah. you know, that I find there, right? A lot of martial arts, a lot of come got out there uh, today is really the same infrastructure as any regular martial arts system out there. You know, running mm -hmm. a dojo, belt structures. And um, you know different levels and different uh, curriculums and different techniques for the same situations. A lot of it contradicts what Kamaga, uh, philosophy is. Um, and there's nothing wrong with that. People have to run businesses. It's fine. People want a lot more information and material. That's fantastic. It's great. Um, um, but for me, my, my interest really is only on, on real life survival. And so, um, as far as what that looks like, you know. And you know, when I run um, instructor courses uh, uh, and I certify instructors in my system, um, it is we cover the main subject matters of what it is 
is that is the most probable that people will face in real world scenarios, which is, you know, everyone relates empty hand situations, strikes, grabs, uh, holds, uh, stand up on the ground, um, knife, firearm, impact weapon, and multiple attackers. Um, we cover all that in a very, very condensed time frame. Um, I run my course in a four day time frame. And a lot of people say it's not possible that you can cover a curriculum and make an instructor in four days. Now, first of all, I, I don't make instructors in, in four days. People come to the course, they already have to have um, uh, a substantial background in martial arts mm -hmm. and teaching experience. What I do is equip them with a mentality, a philosophy, and a methodology, more tactics. But the beauty of it is I can turn around and say that, yes, I, I can cover all that ground extremely effectively because I stick true to that philosophy of club that it is absolute minimal. I don't have to use the word techniques, but techniques or tactics, principle driven. And everything we do is a principle. We have a, a core foundation to our system. We have a drill that covers that core, teaches us the, the ranges and the most effective tools in those ranges um, and how we quickly uh, 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 govern the ranges, bite the ranges, dominate those ranges, how we take control of an opponent really quick as far as all the human factors go. And from there, we simply work everything right back, back to this core. So a situation might start, you know, with a punch. It might start with a bear hug. It might start with a tackle attempt. It might start mm -hmm. with an impact weapon. Now, when we talk, talk about weapon, each, each weapon brings to the table its own set of required rules we have to adhere to. So you have to first govern those um, attributes that weapon brings, and then as quickly as we can, we revert right back to the, to the core. So no matter where we're brought in a, uh, you know, in a, in a paradigm of a, of a confrontation, we always revert right back to this core uh, uh, foundation of the system, and we're able to cover that next round. And that's exactly how it was when I was running this training for all these specialized units. Um, and, uh, and really, that's, uh, that's it. So we spend a lot more more time in training, uh, even in my classes, on, on um, you know, one or two quick drills that uh, that are refreshers of our foundation, and then a lot of mm -hmm. repetition, different scenarios at that point, like that, you know, they, they are always repeating constantly the other uh, core foundation. Hmm. That's, uh, that's uh, really interesting. So it's, it's almost like you're getting the instructor to strip down what they learn rather than teaching them and building new new stuff on top of it. <clears throat> um, people can walk into our system with a wealth of a background in whatever it is that they do, um, and they can take our system as an added tool uh, uh, for what they what they do, what they teach. People can walk in with zero training whatsoever and say, "Look, I want to start training, and I like what you have to uh, to offer here," and you know, make that their uh, uh, their whole system. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, that exactly was the, is the principle is that it's a tool, right? You can't, you can't look at anything that relates to combat um, as a totality, as far as a tactic, a method, or, or even a weapon, right? And uh, that kind of the most, probably the most prominent example of that is all of these gun nuts out there, right? Yeah. I just shoot them. I carry a gun. It's fine. Um, and if you're talking about just shooting a target, if you're talking about just Punching a punching bag, no problem. If you're talking about just, you know, playing in the air with your ass, uh, fixing your knife, that's okay. But when uh, uh, an attacker has an objective to, to harm you at all costs, and they bring to the table their methodology, their mindset, their skills, um, you are bound by what that situation creates. You don't get to choose anything. And you have to be able to transition to any potential play that you might put in. Mm -hmm. um, you might have a gun on you, but you have to be able to produce that gun. You have to be able to discharge it at a range that keeps you safe. That doesn't create a mutual kill scenario, for example, where, you know, if he has a knife and he's in range with that knife and you shoot him, you're both going to be dead. defeats the purpose. Yeah. So you're always going to have these particular a fight situation governing uh, factor is going to be the fight. Whatever tool that's just the add-on. That is what you have to fight to allow for that tool to exist, or you're going to have to negate anything the attacker is doing to allow for your tool to exist, and, and, and vice versa. Um, but it all boils down to the fight. If you don't know how to fight, 
none of the tools that you have are going to help you in many of today's situations. Hmm. That's yeah. That that makes uh, that makes perfect sense. Um, how many affiliates do you do you have currently? Oh, yeah, what's sorry, I didn't hear you. Sorry, how many uh, instructors and affiliates do you have? I have today worldwide. Uh, um, I kicked off my first instructor certification when uh, almost immediately when I got out of the IDF uh, in 10. And from uh, then until today, I have uh, over 600 instructors globally. Oh, wow. That's impressive. Um, and do you run these instructor, like how often do you run these instructor courses? Probably not as often like to, and most certainly not as often as uh, as anyone out there uh, wish that I could. But I I bounce uh, a lot. I don't do this. I know the craft stuff is not my only uh, my only um, thing that I do uh, in life and work wise. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, I strive to run at least two year, um, and I've got two programs. I have a uh, a law enforcement um, certification that I put together. And a lot of that was put together to address the, uh, the growing needs and concerns uh, and threats that law enforcement officers are facing in North America. Um, and uh, I have that. Uh, um, and then I have what I call an open certification, which is for, for anybody, uh, law enforcement, military, you know, security, civilians, yeah. uh, martial artists. I have a lot of people that come to these certifications, not because they're instructors, not because they even want to teach, but for their own. Uh, um, self development, um, and it's really to see a lot of times. You know, these people that just do their own thing in life. Uh, they have found a lot of important values in the martial arts for them, and, and they even have a lot of concerns as far as just keeping themselves and their family safe. And they come to me and say, "Look, I, I'm, I'm not an instructor. I don't have a school. I'm not going to be taking the certification to go and teach, but um, I've done my research. I really want to come and see what you have to offer and uh, see better myself." And uh, and my courses are open. For those individuals as well, my 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 goal, you know, I believe that nothing in chance and nothing in life happens by, by chance. And everything that we do, everybody that we meet, every situation we're put into, it might not seem obvious, but something could be just one grain of a word, something a word said to you, something that you do that at some point in time in your life when that person's like you're having your action with that, that tiny little grain suddenly becomes the world. And if we're is a situation for the better. And so, you know, for me, if somebody comes walking uh, through my door and says, well, listen, I have a black belt, I'm not a martial artist, I'm not interested in teaching, but I want to get a certification because I want to better myself and I want to learn. You know, if God forbid um, that person at some point in their life ended up in a situation where potentially something that I said or showed them could have been the factor that would have kept them or their level alive, I want to make sure that I'm doing my purpose and, and giving that to them. Um, you know, I had, uh, I had quite a few scenarios in, in, uh, throughout my, my teaching career over the course of the last, uh, 20, 25 years <clears throat> where I had, uh, people that would come up to me with, uh, stories afterwards, you know, listen, I, I just got to share with you, um, you know, you taught me this and one day I ended up, uh, with my back against the wall next to my throat and it saved me. Um, I had a lot of these situations and that really, for me, is always a reminder that everything we do has a purpose to it and, and this is my purpose you know I was a messenger from God to give this person what they needed and I did my job I had one situation where unfortunately it, it you know, turned out really bad but I had uh, one student that that was um, in one of my uh, shooting courses uh, here in uh, the Toronto area um, he was a partner in a very uh, popular and large uh, gun store and shooting range and uh, it was about a week or two weeks after he took the training. They came to me after, uh, after the end of the course and said, you know, I wish I had this training years ago. It's really changed my mindset, and, and it's, it's an incredible philosophy, and that's what I'm going to adopt from now on. Um, and then it was a week or two afterwards, uh, his store was robbed. Uh, four guys were store armed, and he ended up being shot and killed. Um, that was, you know, uh, one of those kind of, uh, the most unfortunate one that I've uh, experienced, unfortunately. Yeah. There, you know, um, again, I, I don't know, you know, I don't know if, uh, if it could have ever been done differently, but, uh, but one of those kind of feedback situations that was really the, the most negative, tragic one that I've uh, ever had to, uh, to enjoy as an instructor. But uh, mm. my philosophy is just a gift, you know, everything that I receive, I believe that it's my, my, my duty to, to share with others. 
and uh, hopefully it serves a purpose. If it does, it does. If it doesn't, then uh, it's all good too. Well, this is this has been super interesting. Um, and uh, if someone wanted to uh, take one of your courses, what's the best way to uh, find out about them and to uh, reach out to you? So um, I'm all accessible through, through uh, number one, my website, www.ct707.com. On Facebook, under my name, uh, LinkedIn. Uh, I recently started Instagram. I, I can't hear it, and that's just like, you can reach me through there, but uh, <laughs> I don't just want to get me to one of the other platforms that I've been used to. You know, I've learned how to use. I'm not a tech guy, right? Um, but those are the ones that I can do. Um, I started an online academy uh, a few months back. Um, you know, like everybody having to kind of adapt to this uh, this uh, pandemic uh, uh, is what everybody's calling it situation. Um, uh, so I want to still make my uh, my resources accessible to uh, to people. Uh, I have a lot of instructors have been waiting to get certified, and a lot of people waiting to uh, to get access to the uh, to the courses. Um, so through our website, uh, under the media tab, you'll see the online training academy, and um, uh, we have a lot of uh, material on there. Uh, the instructor certification program is uh, is on there as well. Uh, and uh, I'm starting. Uh, I just started uh, recently, uh, you know, to uh, uh, to get with locally somewhat back to uh, to normal state, um, uh, getting things in place for uh, for actual in-person uh, courses. So I am running a course. I mean, my first one in, uh, over the course of the last uh, year and a half or two years, um, the first important course I'm running is next week in uh, Pennsylvania. Um, uh, it's a law enforcement instructor certification, and then uh, we're doing a, uh, um, a follow-up seminar at uh, Ernie Crooks uh, Kramada School uh, right after that. Um, and uh, I'm just kind of mapping out the calendar right now to see uh, you know, what, uh, what we've got going on and when our next courses are going to be, but uh, we'll have some more coming up soon. Awesome. All right, sir. I want to thank you for uh, taking time out of your busy schedule to come on to the show. And uh, hopefully we get to talk to you and uh, and see you again. My absolute pleasure. Thank you very much. Everybody be well. Stay safe and uh, good luck.